what's, what's, what's astonishing, and I was saying this to some of our speakers this morning, is, is how much work is already happening on the ground in terms of trade facilitation, uh, both at the government level, uh, logistics companies, donor communities, uh, advising uh, uh, consultants, uh, consultancy. It, it really is, stuff is happening, and people aren't waiting something I will remember uh, as, I, as I cover this in, 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 the, uh, in the future. Um, the, um, uh, but, you know, that, that's enough for me. Uh, we really need to keep this tight, and you really are here to, to hear from our eminent panel. So why don't we move uh, very quickly. I'm just going to introduce you uh, to our panelists. You have complete bios, I'm told, uh, in, and complete CVs, I'm sure, uh, in, uh, in, in the program. Uh, but let's just... Uh, Move very quickly if I can just introduce uh, His Excellency Ambassador Richard uh, Sessi Baron, who is Secretary General of the East African Community, has had some uh, very important roles in the uh, uh, in the Rwandan government and is a former ambassador to the U.S. Uh, sitting next to him is Agnes Fitsonga, uh, Fury, who is Vice Chair for East and Southern Africa for the World Customs Organization, and also uh, the Commissioner for Customs and Excise Imports of the Malawi Revenue. Authority. Uh, and uh, next to, uh, uh, down at the end there, we have uh, Stefano Arganese, who is a CEO, CEO of DHL Freight uh, for uh, Central, Eastern, and Southern Europe, is that right? And as well as uh, uh, Africa, uh, the, the Middle East and Africa. Uh, sitting closest to me is uh, uh, Jerome uh, Rodenberg, oh, sorry. Two seats over is Jerome Rodenberg, who is the tallest man at the conference, if you haven't noticed. Uh, he is the ambassador uh, of the Netherlands in charge of private sector and international cooperation from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Sitting next to me is Frank Metzar, who is, uh, and I'm sure I mispronounced that, Frank, but it's, it's right, I'm told. He is, uh, he is the uh, uh, CEO of Trademark East Africa. Uh, an outfit that is really doing a lot of work to, to try and ease the flow of goods across East Africa. And then finally, there is uh, Hamilton Namara. Now, I was told he was the CEO of the Private Sector Federation here in Rwanda, but as I met him just beforehand, I found out that actually on Monday uh, was his first day of work uh, working for Frank here uh, for Trademark East Africa. So somehow they've stuck two people onto this panel, uh, which means that they do very um, really, I, let's move uh, 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 right ahead, and, and we're going to start off with just some opening statements uh, from our speakers, if we have time, and if our speakers keep it short, so please do feel free to, to hiss if it's going on for too long, uh, and we will have a chance to go to the floor. Uh, so really, opening statements of three to five minutes, uh, and then we'll come back for a little bit of a discussion, and hopefully Thank you very much. I, uh, I think my job has been made very easy by both the comments from the Excellency President the government and uh, Minister Kanimba. Uh, what has been happening in East Africa, which is the body that brings together the five partner states of Burundi, Kenya, uh, Uganda, Rwanda, and the United Republic of Tanzania, is simply to try and create a market uh, over 141 million people uh, and an integrated market with the integrated value chains uh, as part of being the building block for the African Union Commission. Now, a lot of the work that has led to the success uh, in East Africa can be summarized in 
I think, three key points. One is political will. Uh, if you look at RDB in Rwanda, a lot has been said about it. But what has not been said is that to get over 10, I don't know how many agencies there were, clear, eight agencies into one roof, get them to talk together, first of all, sit together, talk together, uh, and not become a one-stop stop for, for business, required the political leadership. Uh, and we've seen the results. We are seeing the results in Mombasa, the port of Mombasa, which now has a port charter. Uh, and it took the president to simply go to Mombasa and make sure that banks are open 24 hours a day, that the different institutions that are in Mombasa are working together, uh, that their IT systems speak to each other, and that they are all committed to clear delivery times. And this has brought down uh, clearance times for the port of Mombasa for about not more than 10 days, and the end is started five and below. The same is happening uh, at the port of Dar es Salaam. The reduction of mental barriers that have been in East Africa to political political leadership. The biggest barriers were roadblocks. Now, we had over 35 roadblocks from Dar es Salaam to Kigali, 35. These are police roadblocks, and then revenue roadblocks by the revenue authorities, and then way bridges that act as roadblocks. It was easy to put up those roadblocks, very difficult to remove them. And the people putting them up wanted studies to remove them. And they would say, no, you don't need studies. You, you had no studies to put them up. You need studies to remove them. It took the leadership of the ministers and the presidents to say, no, no roadblocks. Uh, and uh, transit times have come down to what you've had, six days down from 21, from Mombasa to, to Kigali. So, political leadership. The second is the very hard work that the technical, the, the technical people must do. For example, in the East African community, we did uh, domesticate all our agreements, and we have a long process of reducing the number and volume of documentation, things that don't hit the headlines, adoption of common standards, of trade documentation and procedures. The East African Business Council works with us to produce, to agree on industry standards. We have about 1,500 now. Our target is 5,000. Uh, we review procedures adopted in international trade, review them and actually domesticate them. We collect and disseminate information on trade and trade documentation. And we establish joint training programs. The customs officials in East Africa have a common curriculum. They act under an East African uh, uh, Customs Union Management Act, which has removed the need for all other national management acts. They have common curricula, joint trainings, and, and common standards. And finally, there's a lot of work that's ongoing on uh, Borders, we are doing one-stop border posts with support from partners like Trademark East Africa. But it's not just the building. The one-stop border post is about the concept that people will cross borders uh, in less than 30 minutes, as it is now happening in Malaba, which is our biggest uh, crossing point. It used to take uh, weeks to clear trucks. And there were lines of trucks waiting on either side of the border. Now, trucks are crossing in about 30, uh, 30 minutes maximum. They are clearing over 700 trucks a day. They work day and night. And they do this because the Kenyans sit on the Ugandan side and the Ugandans sit on the Kenyan side. Uh, on the Ugandan side, they began by sitting in tents, so they were clearing things intent and uh, working together with no IT, but just the way to do this has moved transit times uh, tremendously. And finally
finally, we are moving towards uh, uh, a single customs territory, which uh, has been piloted on the Northern Corridor, uh, and the piloting is beginning on the Central Corridor from Mombasa, from Dar to to Kigali. The idea here is that you clear your goods at the point of entry, and then they move freely. We want to create, to promote regional value changes, and this will mean that we also have to work on domestic tax harmonization, which is the next agenda. So, harmonization around VAT procedures, around uh, uh, excise tax. Uh, it will also require that we, we move faster on uh, integration of the financial sector, which is why our capital markets uh, are be being integrated. Uh, we, the members, the governors of the central banks just rolled out an East African payment system that allows the special SMEs uh, to carry out their transactions in East Africa using local currency, removing the need for uh, looking for dollars. And, and, and this will also require uh, that we, with the advent of mobile money, the next agenda is to have one area network. The business. The WCO, World Council of Organization, has been working on uh, trade facilitation instruments the past several years and has developed so many instruments uh, to ease the doing business and reduce the cost of doing business. I'm not going into detail. Some of the instruments um, that the WCO has developed, um, my, the princess has just talked about some of the instruments, one for border force, coordinated border management. Um, there are several instruments that have been developed. We've got actually economic competitiveness, economic competitiveness package, which covers several instruments that the WSO has developed. With share information, because for us to move forward now as trade facilitation agreement, there's so much emphasis on cooperation. We need to cooperate, we need to communicate, share information, go to the border, put up big notices that will be telling these SMEs what is expected of them. Because as they are now, they don't know what is expected of them. That's why so many people take advantage of them. At the same time, SMEs do not have information. They don't know which goods are jutable, which ones are not jutable. So sometimes they take a root in the bush to smuggle, something which does not attract duty. But when you capture them, they say, but there's no duty. They're just afraid of something which doesn't exist. But because customs has got a mandate to collect trade statistics. That's why we want them to declare so that we have trade statistics, which the government is going to use to come up with effective policies. That's why we need to make sure that everybody has made a proper declaration and we need that information. So you find SMEs are running through the bush or some drivers will cheat them, I'll carry your goods, help you to smuggle through the border and they pay extra money to these drivers. How do they make profits? There's no profit. Because by the time these goods are caught with these truck drivers, there are penalties that have been levied and they spend so much money. So there's a lot that needs to be done to actually improve on cooperation, consultation. Believe it or not, SMEs are moving volumes across the borders. And the development of our countries depends on the SMEs. We need to help the SMEs to become formal. How do we help them to become formal? As long as they operate from their homes, they will never become formal. The government have to take delivery policies, come up with an area, build some structures, let these SMEs actually pay manageable rentals. Because some of them cannot even afford to go to certain areas to get the money and pay rentals. So an area should be, the, the, those clusters come up with proper areas that should be demarcated specifically for the SMEs. Then you can easily target them because we don't know where to find them. Because we need to help them to improve on the capacity. We want to tell them what incentives we have as customers. We want to tell them that we have pre-clearance as customers. We have special delivery orders if they are bringing perishables, raw materials. They don't have to do the whole process. We can give a special delivery order. 
They, they quickly go through the border, but they're not aware. So I think the government should come up with specific areas to give them places where they can operate from. I think the previous panel talked about also the development, maybe um, loans for the SMEs. Most of the SMEs are ladies. And for them to access funding, it's not easy. Sometimes the, the, the people giving the funds will ask them to go and call the husband. But the husband is not interested in the business. If anything, you are bringing somebody who's going to commit something he's not interested in. And it excites me about this forum that we have the women forum here, because I look at the women as the future. The women are the custodians of the family for the continuation. The little money the woman makes, make sure that the children go to school, they have food, they have clothing. Men uh, can be, my apologies, men. They will marry, have children. They find another next attractive woman, they move. They forget their, their children. So the burden of the family remains with the woman. That's why if we have delivery places to focus on the women, it's going to help our economy to develop. And we as customers are prepared to find them and give them as much information as possible and assist them. At regional level, for Mesa Sada, there have been uh, a lot of uh, initiatives to simplify procedures, simplify the forms, and uh, there's also a, a charter under Comesa for the SMEs and uh, to help them. And World Bank has joined the, 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 the Comesa to actually, actually um, to roll out this charter so that the SMEs can understand how they can be facilitated. And it's something which is very important so that uh, we don't just come up with several fees which the SMEs have to pay. So special policies to really assist them would actually help our countries to develop. It's something that very basic that we need to do, but we're not doing it because there are no drivers. I think the, our president here, Kagame, said it all, that you need that vision and it can be done. And I also want to echo on from the previous and the current previous speaker about the developing the, the, the castle of the single territory. It's working. And there's also coalition of the winning, which Kenya is also doing with Rwanda. And in my region, I have Kenya, which is on board. So I'm able to know the developments that are happening there. I think East Africa has gone way ahead compared to, to Sadiq and Comesa. That's why they didn't have a single target which they are using. So we have an example which we can actually borrow and benchmark within uh, Africa and see how we can actually develop and move forward. So it's a matter of saying, let's move all these disconnections. Let's share information. I can say more about ICT. It's already been said that if you want to do meaningful transformation, ICT connectivity is important. You go to these borders, you see all these agencies. All the customs are modernized. Agriculture, veterinary, they're still money. And why are they enjoying being at the border? It's because they can get a bribe. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't fight corruption, we'll move nowhere. I think there's more I can say, but uh, I think I need to actually uh, leave my colleagues to um, maybe cover the well, other areas. We'll come back to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Hannington, uh, I, I think I. I'm going to turn to you. It's uh, I think it's it's your turn to defend the men of Africa uh, <laughs> after the uh, uh, after the last speaker. Uh, no, I, I mean important. I'll feel free to defend men, uh, uh, but uh, I really want to turn to you for for a view from the private sector. Partly your old hat on, and also your new hat on, which presumably will be focused on helping the private sector uh, kind of navigate through those borders and, and, and ease the path uh, for. That concept that came up in the, in, in, in the last session, uh, which uh, I jotted down immediately because it was very catchy, and we journalists love catchy things, uh, of turning a country known for being landlocked to one that is landlinked. I think that's a fascinating concept, and that really is, 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 is something. Tell us a little bit about, about how the private sector here is taking advantage of what's happening and how things are changing. Thank you, Sean. Um, Indeed, uh, as Rwanda, uh, from a private sector point of view, being uh, what people used to call landlocked, and now what we look at as landing, 
um, was a question first of all of mindset that is excellent in the morning, looking at the challenges and opportunities. Um, uh, from the one point of view, uh, we needed to, uh, from the onset, those who we call the history of Rwanda, yeah, after 1994, uh, creating a resilient private sector that you know would trade within itself within Rwanda, but also look beyond the borders to tap into the opportunities across borders. Um, so it is, it has been a diplomatic change on our side uh, from the point of creating strong institutions that will support that growth or, or that creation of the private sector, the Asian private sector, um, and, and then back it up with policies, uh, back it up with uh, uh, policies of support trade and investment. And, and that for us has been, uh, from the private sector point of view, has been a key milestone. You would imagine how hard it would have been for, for a Rwandan SME that is largely uh, informal to start thinking about how they you know, go across the border to trade uh, or, or invest or, or go around things like work permits or go around things like uh, tapping into skills that you need. So all this has only been able to be put in place because of the policies that uh, uh, Rwandan government, uh, thanks to the government here, that, that they have embraced. And secondly, linking it now to the uh,
is so important what people, African people especially, can do for their own continent. And we employ about 500,000 people around the world. And one thing that we really promote a lot is moving people uh, from one country to another, making sure that they get experience uh, everywhere around the world, and then potentially come back to their country, use that experience here. We have very many managers at the moment and executives as well coming from Africa or around the world. Some of them uh, are going back to their countries, some are staying. But obviously, you can imagine that one of one, one of I don't know what one this person is a manager in, in, a, in a country in Europe or US or wherever. They do very much uh, or as much as they can to facilitate <coughs> business in their own region. That is another way of helping uh, developing in developing countries. Stefano, thank you very much. We're now going to come to the man with the money. Jeroen uh, uh, Rudenberg, you are, you are here as a representative of the donor community, and really, and, and, and I think what's uh, uh, one of the stories that we often hear in terms of, of, of trade facilitation and the discussion of the trade facilitation agreement at a, at a lofty WTO level is that this is something that is proposed and advanced by the, by the, by the rich world, the, the, the EU, and, 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 and so on, that they want to impose it on the, on, 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 on the developing world. Clear from, from what we've already heard this morning that that's that's, that's not the truth. Uh, there's clearly a lot of appetite for it, but, but there is this dynamic there. At the same time, there's also uh, there is a lot of money and uh, uh, out there, and there's a growing pool of money uh, out there available to help countries uh, 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 implement some some of these things. Just talk a little bit about the trade facilitation agreement and what donors are doing to try and help. Thank you very much. Um, I would prefer not to be introduced as a donor, uh, even less now that I've been here for two days uh, as, as before. I mean, we are a development partner uh, for the countries in Africa and other countries, uh, because that's the way we want to go about it. I'm representing our minister, Liliana Plumen. She's the Minister for Foreign Trade and Development Cooperation. I think you would agree with me that it's a rather rare combination uh, to be seen but we believe it's the right combination because, as we said yesterday, uh, trade works for development. And that's why we have a minister who combines the two portfolios. And uh, let me just briefly try to explain in order to allow for, uh, for questions and discussion uh, how we go about it. A large part of our budget is dedicated towards uh, private sector development. So as a country that depends largely on trade, on investment, with an open economy, with SMEs who are the backbone of our economy. Uh, we understand how important it is to build the infrastructure for trade and investment. So that's also what we try to do when we uh, assist developing uh, countries uh, in building their own infrastructure. So a large part of our budget goes to the enabling environment, which means we help to assist build infrastructure, uh, access to finance, uh, provide knowledge and skills where we can, we work together with Dutch companies. So we have targeted uh, sectors in which we can offer technology and knowledge, water, uh, food security, the agricultural sector, logistics. Those are sectors that we have built our economy, our own economy on. So we try to provide this assistance uh, also to uh, developing countries. Trade facilitation agreement, I really hope that it will be possible to get the agreement back on track because we believe uh, it will um, enable the developing countries to, to profit more from uh, global supply chains. And uh, I think that OECD has shown that uh, the developing countries stand to gain most uh, of the trade facility agreement. Um, as you said before, we are already uh, supporting trade facilitation in various ways. Um, we support the World Bank uh, trade facilitation facility. Uh, we support um, Trade Park East Africa. Uh, we also support uh, CBI. There's a representative in uh, this room, uh, which helps uh, through capacity uh, building uh, the exports from developing countries to the EU. And I think through those interventions, we try to facilitate trade. 
But if the trade facil uh, facilitation agreement uh, comes along and there will be a trade facilitation uh, facility, as was proposed by the Director General of the WTO uh, BG, uh, will be uh, very positive and actively looking to support that as well. The enabling environment that I mentioned before is the second important uh, pillar of our private sector development program. Um, we, will, we have launched uh, the Dutch Good Growth Fund will be explained in more detail by one of my colleagues in a parallel session. This fund provides access to finance for SMEs in uh, developing countries, SMEs who want to invest and uh, access to finance is one of the obstacles that was explained this morning and we try to do our bit by uh, launching this fund. My last point uh, that I want uh, to make is the importance of public-private partnerships. Um, uh, as I said, the works and that we want to make sure that the growth is inclusive, the growth in developing countries, we need to work together with the private sector, the Dutch private sector as well. And one initiative we would like to highlight is the Sustainable Trade Initiative, where we go down the supply chain uh, all the way to the smallholder farmer and make sure that through investment by the buyers and the traders, and uh, with us matching uh, the investment, they stand to gain as well uh, from trade uh, and um, investment. Thank you. My apologies for, uh, uh, for, for, for calling you a donor. From now on, I will consider you a partner. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Frank, I'd, I'd like to finish with you. And, and Frank, I, and, and the reason I wanted to finish with you is it's always good to, to end on a happy note. And, uh, and I have a, uh, uh, as we traded emails ahead of this. Uh, session, uh, uh, Frank got, I think, probably the happiest of them all. He said, what we really want to hear from you is the success stories. And, uh, and so, I, I, Frank, I, I'd really like, you've been working on uh, uh, a trademark uh, in East Africa, uh, providing trade uh, technical assistance and, and helping trade, uh, facilitating trade uh, through East Africa. A trademark East Africa to be sponsoring this event, so thank you. Uh, and and um, I guess... Maybe it's just worth saying trade facilitation sounds really boring, but it isn't, right? It's actually quite exciting. And when you get stuff done, it has a big effect. And, you know, right at the top, I think, of the success story in East Africa is the political will and the excellent leadership we've got. And the Secretary General, you and His Excellency this morning play a huge part in that. The quiet revolution that's gone on in trade in East Africa should be recognised. Getting, halving the time to get trade from the port of entry to Kigali is a huge achievement. And uh, I think it's something that will really transform the dynamics of our region. And I, I wanted to say one of the big success stories has been led by um, our leaders in East Africa on the single customs territory. Time to Kigali, when I started work with trademark in 2009 10, 28 days to get to Kigali. And now, depending on the metric, you could say it's as low as six. And that really is a huge achievement, isn't it? I think so. And that shows trade facilitation really isn't boring at all. But what other success stories has, has there been? I mean, I, I must say, as Trademark, we're really delighted to work with partners all around the region. And great things have happened here in Rwanda, working with the Rwanda Revenue Authority. Um, the new um, electronic single window has reduced clearance times um, hugely from around three or four days to less than 20 hours, I understand. And the exciting thing is the actual cost to import the container has fallen from $400 to $50. And that's a massive gain for the private sector. We estimate that's about, about $30, $40 million a year that benefits Rwanda. Another example of a, of a success um, in Uganda, the, the introduction of the new customs management system has reduced clearance times from five days to two, and it's increased uh, customs revenue by 20%. That's a huge gain. And if you go to Kampala now, you can see the container being tracked electronically from Mombasa all the way through the country. And that's a sort of very exciting um, thing for the private sector. The private sector now has access to that. Driver productivity has gone up 50% because when the driver stops, actually folks see that. I think um, another, the third example of something that's really worked well is in Burundi. And in Burundi, 
We've been working, I must say, with the, the new revenue authority there to help set it up. And that has resulted in doubling the revenues of the country in three years. That is an additional $400 million for, on the back of an investment of around $15 million on our part. A huge, huge gain, I think, for, for Burundi. And we worked and followed the money. That's about 40,000 people a month that get access to healthcare now through own domestic resources that didn't before. But those are good, three good examples, but I think you asked me to think about what are the next ones. Um, well, I think um, there's huge gains to be seen, particularly for small traders. And I'm excited with our team and stakeholders around the region to really think about how can we reduce the huge burdens and, and, and hurdles that small traders face, particularly women at borders. And we're very excited about the potential to actually stop harassment at the borders and scale up some of the, the early successes uh, that we've been doing at Busia, Muchukula, and Gatuna. I think the second is really something that was kicked off and, and Secretary General mentioned, a reform charter to halve the time through the port of Mombasa and Dar es Salaam. And to me, delivering that um, for Rwanda could be one of the biggest gains for this country. And I think that that's very much within reach. And finally, I think maybe the third thing to look ahead to is actually thinking about how the private sector can really get involved in all of this. And I think one of the things we're very excited about with our partnership with the East African Business Council is really getting the private sector voice fully into the whole regional integration and trade uh, agenda. I think there's been a lot of success with the roundtables that the uh, Secretary General's um, been chairing. But I think there's a lot more to do, particularly around standards and getting trade moving. And um, I really do think that East Africa is on the move. And there's a lot of exciting developments that are going on and a lot more to do. Thank you very much, Frank, uh, and uh, thank you all, uh, speakers. Unfortunately, we have come to the end of our, our, our session here, so uh, just as a, there's a lot of exciting uh, movement happening in, uh, in, in East Africa now, there's a lot of more exciting movement to happen within this uh, hotel complex over the next few hours. I've been asked to, to, to just make a couple of logistical announcements uh, uh, before we go to lunch, which is waiting for us uh, just downstairs and outside. To get to lunch, you have to go out the back doors and you'll take a left and you'll find uh, seats for us in, 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 in a tent outside. Uh, the first set of, of WEDF parallel sessions will start at 2.30 uh, uh, this afternoon. Uh, the session on growing SMEs through impact investment will take place in this room. Uh, this session is supported by Trademark East Africa. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, the, uh, uh, the session entitled Sustainability Standards from Barrier to Opportunity will be held in the session tent. That's on the other side of the restaurant tent. That's the one to go to if you have a big lunch. Uh, the, uh, um, and the session on e-solutions for SME export growth will take place, uh, sorry, and then they will be followed by second set at four o'clock. The session on e-solutions for SME export growth will take place in this room, and the one on spurring innovation through SME incubators will be in the tent. Those will all wrap, wrap up by six o'clock. There are, of course, biomentor group meetings that are gonna be taking place uh, for the coffee sector, but those start at, at, at 4.30. Uh, they are gonna be, and also for the services sector, the coffee sector is in the auditorium directly underneath us. The services sector is next is in the meeting room next to the hotel's swimming pool. You can catch a swim as well if you want. Uh, and then tonight uh, we have, of course, the big party. Uh, the conference dinner starts at 7 p.m. in the tent where you, where you, where you will have had lunch. Uh, there is going to be entertainment. Uh, there will also be a handicraft exhibition. It's a good place to get a gift uh, to bring home to your family. Um, and there will be plenty of seating. We also, the good news is that the dress code for dinner tonight is kept. Um, the, and that we will have, uh, after that, we'll have buses to the hotel that leave at 9.15 and 10.15 from outside the registration area. And just one last thing. Now, some of you dropped phones at the registration desk uh, as you came in this morning. And they've got a big bag of phones down there that they don't know what to do with. Please go pick them up. Um, uh, if not, they will end up uh, on the uh, next truck to Mombasa and ship back out uh, uh, to, uh, to Europe as part of the Green Exports strategy. Uh,
Thomas, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your patience. Uh, go ahead and, 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 and enjoy lunch. Oh, there's just one last thing. There's a beautiful earring here that someone has lost. The man in the room who lost his beautiful earring can come find me. Thank you again, and thank you for our speakers.